Good morning, CCF Davao. Okay, it's indeed a privilege and an opportunity for me to stand in front of you here, sharing the pulpit of Pastor Bob and Pastor Richie and Brother Ferdy. And thank you very much also for praying before I deliver this message. This morning, I will be the storyteller. So at the end of this message, I pray that you will remember not so much the storyteller, but the story which is coming from straight leaf of the Word of God. This morning, I'll be sharing to you chapter 46 of Genesis. And in order to understand deeply or intimately this chapter, we have to look at it in its proper context. So when we look at the context, we have to connect it with the chapter previous to it so that we will know the story as it unfolds. And now, since Genesis is composed of 50 chapters, we are now in the 46th chapter, and that is uh, four chapters to go, and we are done, and we will be having a great picture, a bigger picture of what Genesis is all about. And as we all know, there is going to be a walk through the Bible in the Old Testament, and this is going to prepare us some more to give us some of a foretaste of what the whole Bible or the Old Testament specifically is all about, and it will strengthen us in our faith. Now, in Genesis chapter 46, we can see that if we run through the entire chapter, this talks about the moving of the family of Jacob to Egypt. So he started somewhere, and because of a great famine, as Joseph prophesied or, or foretold to Pharaoh and the entire nation of Egypt, that there will be a great famine. There will be seven years of famine in all the world, in all the known world except for Egypt. And after that famine, or after that plenty, I'm sorry, seven years of plenty, there will be seven years of famine. And right now, two years after the famine started, Jacob and his entire family will, will be moving to, to uh, Egypt. And so... We will be reading first the few verses of Genesis 46. And as, and as we unfold, we will be going from one chapter or one verse to another so that we'll have an entire picture or a snapshot of the chapter 46 of Genesis. So let's go through some verses first. In Genesis chapter 46, verse 1, it tells us, So Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba, and offered sacrifices to God, to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And she said, Here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will, be, for I will make you a great nation there. Verse 4. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will surely bring you up again, and Joseph will close your eyes. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their little ones and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. In verse 6, they took their livestock and their property which they had acquired in the land of Canaan and came to Egypt. Jacob and all his descendants with him. His sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. So we will see a picture that this entire Genesis chapter 46 is a moving of the entire family of Jacob from the land of Canaan, specifically from Hebron to Egypt. And as we all know, so that we will be benefited directly from the Word of God, let's remember the acrostic oil because oil will help us in our understanding and our studying of the Scripture so that it will be able to, we will be able to apply it in our lives. So oil stands for O, observation. So we will observe what the Scripture tells us. And then I stands for interpretation. Interpretation states that let Scripture inter interpret Scripture. It cannot be otherwise. If there is an interpretation of the Scripture, Scripture and other verses and texts of the, the, the entire Bible will be congruent in interpreting itself. 
And then finally, knowledge is nothing even if we have observed what's written in the, in, the, in the Word of God and if we have interpreted it correctly, but if we will not apply it in our lives, then it is useless. So L is life application. Observation, interpretation, and life application. Edmund Chan once said, Truth doesn't change. Truth applied change. Truth does not change. Truth applied change. And that is why we will dig in in this very wonderful chest of treasures, which is the Word of God. And when we have understood the principles that the Word of God is telling us, we will now apply it directly in our lives. So that we will not just fill our minds, we will fill our hearts and make our hands ready to follow the will of God. So let us move on. Before we go to, to verse one of verse uh, verse one of chapter forty six, we have to go to chapter forty five or the previous verse, which is at the later portion. So verse 20, 27 says, When they told him all the words of Joseph, this day refers to the brothers of Joseph, who after they kiss and make up, when they discovered that it was Joseph who became grand vizier of Egypt or the prime minister of Egypt. Therefore, there was this great joy among the brothers and then Joseph instructed them to go back to their father and tell their father what happened to him. And so, when they told him all the words of Joseph, they were now talking to Jacob, that he had spoken to them and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob revived. So he had this adrenaline shoot. So he was so happy. My son is alive because he knew that for 22 years, Joseph was dead. And now with all this splendor, with all the, this marvelous report that Egypt is ruled by his son, Joseph, as a prime minister and a grand vizier. So maybe his heartbeat was 110 over or 180 over 140 because he was so revived. And this is what's happening. And because of this, in verse 28, it says, then Israel or Jacob said, It is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. So he was really very upbeat. I want to see my son. I want to hear about the many things that was, that was withheld from me for the past 22 years. And I want to see for myself the glory and the splendor of Joseph. And I want to see him before I die. So this is now the picture he was still in Hebron, and then they will be going to Egypt. But before that, there are some stories along the way. So Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of the father of his father Isaac. So when you say so, that means immediately, without haste, without any compulsion he wants to move immediately when he said so israel set out with all so this word all everything that he had his family his children his grandchildren his livestock and everything in them they set out but before they go to egypt there is this special place that they will have a stopover and this place is called Beersheba. this is a very unique place in the line of the family of Jacob. Okay, where is Beersheba? So if you look at the area or the land of Palestine, they were living in Hebron or Hebron. And then they traveled from Hebron to Beersheba, which is about 27 kilometers. So in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 21, verse 33, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba. Okay, so you will notice here, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord. So we will see, he called on the name of the Lord. So in that place, Abraham called on the name of the Lord in Beersheba. And also, then he, Isaac, 
In Genesis chapter 26, verse 23, he, Isaac, went up from there to Beersheba. Again, no? So Isaac had an encounter with God at Beersheba and also uh, the Lord appeared to him, Isaac, the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. Okay? So you will notice now, Abraham had an encounter at Beersheba. Isaac had an encounter with Beersheba. And now it's Jacob's turn to have an encounter with God himself. Okay, in Genesis chapter 46, verse 1, which is our main text, so Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. So this stopover, there is now an offering of sacrifices. Now look at the context first. When, when Jacob knew that J Joseph is alive, so he really wanted to see his, his child. So when he offered sacrifices in this very particular and unique place, he was offering his thanksgiving to God. The first reason for offering this thanksgiving to God is because he knew what had happened to Joseph. Joseph was alive or Joseph is alive, and then uh, he became gloriously splendored as the prime minister of Egypt. So that's something to be thanked for. So that's part of his offering. And another one is because there was so much quarreling in the family of Jacob, he was also offering to God in thanksgiving because of the changes that he saw in his children. So they all kiss and make up. They hug each other. They cried. Uh, with each other and then forgiving each other and then Joseph told them to go back to their parents to, to Jacob and then knowing that they are already strong in terms of relation, relationship they have reconciled with each other then Jacob has something worthy to offer in thanksgiving and another one when we offer sacrifices it is also possible that during that time because he is still in Beersheba and he, he still has to travel a few hundred kilometers on wagons and he is already old so he was asking for a good a safe and a blessed journey so these are the things that he have that that he has to thank god for now also in our lives there are also times that we will be asking something from god so we will now go to the lessons or to the foundation or the biblical principles which we can derive from this chapter So the title of our message this morning is How to Make Godly Decisions. Every day in our lives, there are crucial moments that we'll be making decisions. Going from one place to another, going abroad, getting married, purchasing properties, or sending our children to school, or getting married. Should I marry this guy? Or if ever, should I remarry if I'm a widow or a widower? So those are the decisions that we have to make in life. But... In our study today, it has to be according to God's plan and purposes. And in order to benefit from this study, we will have to dig in these wonderful uh, treasures of God's Word on how to make godly decisions. So first, a thankful heart prepares us to listen to God's commands. If we are already thankful, our hearts were saying, Lord, thank you for these wonderful things that you have done in my life. Thank you for giving me wonderful children. Thank you for, for the relationships that I have with my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the ministry that I am involved in. Then we will say, Lord, what thou hast to tell me that I may follow. Because your heart has been opened like a fertile ground ready to receive God's word. Then when you are thankful already, whatever you ask from God, God will command you and you are ready to follow His commands because your heart is already ready and uh, ready to be planted with instructions from God. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says to the Philippians, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So when he said thanksgiving, 
when we ask something from God, when we supplicate in prayer, when we ask, Lord, I pray that you will guide me in these things. Lord, I pray that I am going through this difficulty in my life. Guide me. So while we are asking, while we are supplicating, while we are asking something from God, like a child to a father or to the parents, we have this heart of thankfulness. Then we will be ready whatever God will instruct us in terms of our prayer. A thankful heart prepares us to listen to God's commands. In Genesis chapter 4, uh, chapter 46, verse 2, God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here I am. Okay, so there is now this special conversation. There is now this exclusive revelation of God to Jacob or God's talking to his children. So what can we see here? What can we learn from here? God reveals himself unmistakably. Hindi nagkakamali ang Panginoon if it tells us something. God will not make something mysterious or mystical in his revelation of himself or when he instructs us of something to do in our lives. We cannot say, let us go to the fortune teller and ask them, what is this for us? Or we will go to the, what you call that in the, uh, Sojak, Sojak. Uh, today is February, maybe this is the love month. I don't know what's the Sojak sign for February, but okay, let us see there. No? God does not do that. Or he will not reveal himself in, in a form of an apparition, or he will not use somebody that will tell, oh, the Lord tells me that you will be, marrying this guy or you will be marrying this girl or the lord tell me told me that one day when you buy a sweepstakes you will win one million or ten million or whatever god reveals himself unmistakably so how does god reveals himself look at this one so we will see in verse three he said i am god i am god He says, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. So when he says, I am God, ako ang Dios, I am the God of your father. So what does this tell us when he says, I am the God of your father? So he was telling Jacob, I am the God of your father, Isaac. I am the God of your father, Abraham. So this tells us that God does not say, I am the God who created the heavens and the earth. Of course, that is true. But you cannot define God according to your own terms or according to our own terms. We will say, ah, I don't believe that God is the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. I believe that God is love. I believe that God is uh, the God who will just uh, allow everything to happen. Or I will say, God is is." does not have this righteousness in him. He will just forego any sins that we do. No. God is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he will reveal himself unmistakably. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says there, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So in their time, there was no Bible yet. So God spoke to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And before the time of Moses, they spoke to them in a special revelation. One on one, God will speak to them in the burning bush, in, in, in terms like this, in nights and visions. So those are the times when God reveals himself. And then during the time of Moses, when God spoke to Moses and he revealed the law, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of these were the law giving. So Moses wrote all of these things and he reveals God in this way. So the law was given to the people of Israel. And then after that, during the divided kingdom, during the time of David and then Solomon, and then when Israel was divided into the northern and the southern kingdom, 
God spoke to the people of Israel or to the nation of Israel by the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Habakkuk, and, and all of those prophets of old. So they spoke to them, revealing without going beyond the Old Testament laws. But now, the Hebrew writer said, but in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son. What is this last days? The last days means that when Jesus Christ came into the world, became a human being, and up to this time where we live now is the last days. So God will speak to us by his son. And when he speaks to us, he speaks to us in Jesus Christ. There's no other son, only Jesus Christ. So when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. It's very exclusive. So when he tells, if you believe in me, you will have eternal life, for I am the resurrection and the life. So it's very, very exclusive. So when God reveals to us, it cannot be apart from Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ won't make himself dubious. He won't make himself unclear. He wants to establish himself as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of us all. And when he speaks to us in our time, through the Holy Spirit, only by the Word of God. So we cannot go beyond the Scripture. So if we have some dreams right now, and if our friends will tell us, you know, brother, you know, sister, I have dreamt of you last night that you will be blessed by God. Oh, that's good because that's within the Scripture. But when you say, oh, brother or sister, oh, I have dreamt of you last night, and I saw you going to America, going to Egypt, going to like that. So you will have some question marks. But when he say, oh, brother or sister, I saw in my dream that you will be leaving your wife and go to get married with this another guy. Oh, that's a very big question mark because God will declare himself or will reveal himself unmistakably, and that is to the Lord Jesus Christ and according to the word of God. So we learn from here, Jesus Christ also said, I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So there is always that relationship of Jesus Christ to the God of Israel. So take note, I highlighted that word, I am. That means Jesus Christ is comparing himself to the great God of the Old Testament. Because in this case, when he was talking to the Sadducees about the resurrection, the, the, the Sadducees don't believe because they say they want to test the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, there are seven brothers. These seven brothers, the eldest married this woman, and then that oldest, eldest brother died. So according to the law of Moses, the second brother must marry this woman and bear children in behalf of the first brother. But the second brother died. And then the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh. So the question when they're all in heaven, if there's such a thing as the resurrection, whose wife is he, is she? Because they're all married to them. So Jesus Christ told them, you don't know what the scripture talks about. Because in heaven, there will be no marrying there. No one will be given in marriage. And there will be no marriage there. Like husband and wife, uh, Second husband, first husband, third husband, like that. Because they will be no marriage there. They will be like the angels. And so, Jesus Christ said, you don't understand the scripture. That's why he said, there will be a resurrection. And that's the claim of Jesus Christ going back to the claims of saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the, the God of the dead, but of the living. So, Jesus Christ was saying, God is the God of the Old Testament. They are still alive in the presence of God. And even at this moment, the living in the flesh, He is still our God. And that claim, I am, bears something that is heavy in the person of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, verse 56, Jesus Christ said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw and it was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? You're still less than 50 and you have seen Abraham? How is that? Because Jesus Christ said, God rejoiced to see my day. And then, what did Jesus Christ say? Jesus said to them, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. So grammatically, in English, something is wrong there because truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. So does that mean to say Jesus Christ was born before Abraham? No. Jesus Christ's being before he became human is already existing. He is already existing with the God of the heavens and the earth. Because John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you see, Jesus Christ pre-existed already, and the Jews understood these things. The Jews understood that Jesus Christ, because of the Word I am, was claiming equality with God the Father. And because of that statement, they picked stones to stone Jesus Christ, to kill Jesus Christ. They understood that Jesus Christ is claiming to be God. And therefore, in our times today, in our lives today, the God that is revealed to us cannot be revealed apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. So when God will speak to us, when we make our decisions, it is always anchored to what Jesus Christ would say in whatever situation we have. It's not something that the psychologists will say. It's not something that other people will say. But it is simply what the Lord Jesus Christ will say in His Word. So, God reveals Himself unmistakably only in Jesus Christ. Second, we cannot hear Jesus Christ speak to us audibly, but we have everything we need when we walk in this world, in our Christian life. And how is that? That is through the Scriptures. That is why we are so thankful that in this day and age, we have so many ways of reading and studying the Word of God. We have the hard print, we have the electronic file, we have the iPad, we have the iPhone, so that we are without excuse because we have the Scriptures. And these things will be our guide as we go through the world. So God reveals Himself unmistakably in Jesus Christ and through the Scriptures. Jesus Christ even said, you study the scripture because you think that in them you will have eternal life. So he was talking to the Pharisees. Okay, you keep on reading the scriptures. You fill your minds with the word of God, with the laws of Moses, with the sayings of the prophets. But you do not know that these scriptures, this very scripture speak about me. So Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was saying, you cannot separate me from the scripture. So as we study the Old Testament, we are looking at Jesus Christ himself. And when, when we study the New Testament, we are also looking at Jesus Christ himself. So the whole scripture, the Old Testament to the New Testament, talks about Jesus Christ. And it is really helpful in making us the right and godly decision. It can never be separated. Psalm said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So whatever path we are going through, there is always that light. And what is that word? That is the word of God. Now moving on to Genesis verse 3. He said, I am the God, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. Now the Lord knows what Jacob was thinking because he already said, do not be afraid. Just like us. When we do some changes in directions of our plans in life, when we move from one place to another, or when we make decisions, the Lord knows what's inside our hearts. He knows us more than we know ourselves. That is why, even without Jacob mentioning what's inside his heart, God said, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. So this is the proof. In Psalm 94 verse 11, the Lord knows the thoughts of men and they are mere breath. So even the way we think, even the way we do some, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if option A, option B, C, D, E, F, G, until the entire alphabet, the English alphabet. The Lord knows that. And in Psalm 44 verse 21, would not God find this out? For he knows the secrets of our hearts. 
So the Lord really knows us. And that is why even before we tell these things to him, the Lord will, will, will speak to us. And he spoke to Jacob. Okay, that's why he said, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. The question now is, why was Jacob or why was Israel afraid to go down to Egypt? Because the Lord said, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. But the question is, why is Israel? Bakit takot si Israel or si Jacob to go down to Egypt? Okay, the fears of Jacob are this. He was 130 years old and fit for travel for a long journey. So matanda na siya. Now, maybe some of us here cannot reach that, that age, but in our time right now, to the, to, the day, to the day that we die or when we are buried six feet below the ground, there is still that day, you know, things that will be happening between now and the day when we face our Maker. Okay? And sometimes we are afraid of some changes in our lives. Maybe to leave our comfort zone, we don't want to go from this place to another because we don't want to travel. The temperature is colder there. Or if we are in a, in a mildly uh, temperate climate, we don't want to go somewhere that is hot or somewhere that is cold. But we, don't want, we just want to stay put where we are. Or maybe let's go, with, let's go into something that is very applicable. If we are in this church, you know, in the CCF, we have been coming here, we have been coming here, joining CCF, and we have been growing and growing, and we know that the discipleship process is connect, believe, grow, mentor, and multiply. And the only way to grow is joining through the D group, and then God is telling us, my son, my daughter, I want you to grow and be more transformed in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I believe that joining the D group is something that will help you. So instead of saying, I'm too old for that, I'm too busy for that, if that is what the Lord wants you to do, then by all means, join. Now, if you have been nurtured already, you have been mentored and you have been fully equipped by the Lord, and God is telling you, my son, my daughter, be a D-group leader. Teach what you know. Disciple others. Because Matthew 28, 19 to 20, the Lord says, Therefore, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I will, bid you, I will be with you till the end of the ages. And that is the mandate of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we do not want to stay in our comfort zone. We have to move as the Lord will tell us. Those are legitimate fears. Maybe you will say, I'm not equipped for that. I'm not ready for that. But the Lord will tell you, go down to Egypt because I will be with you. Go and handle these things. Make some deviation of the courses of your course in life because that is the direction that you're going to take according to my will because I am your God and I have paid dearly for you by shedding the blood of my son for you. And you will not just be there, but I want you to be my true disciple. These are the fears of Jacob. And another one is Okay, just to prove that he's 130 in 47:9 of Genesis, so Jacob said to Pharaoh, "The years of my sojourning are 130." So just to prove that Jacob was 130 when he was already talking with Pharaoh when he already reached Egypt. So number 2, as a father, he fears his children would be influenced by Egypt. So he was there in Beersheba after conversing with the Lord. And then he was contemplating on these things. I am old. And then my children might be influenced by a culture that is so different from us. Because he remembered what his father and his grandfather taught them. That you will be a chosen nation. You will be a separate race. You will be a distinct people. And then we will be merging, we will be saturated, or we will be in the influence of very, very different culture, which is the Egyptians. Now apply it to ourselves. Maybe when we go to a place, we are afraid that our children as fathers might be influenced by other cultures. And that is true. But if God will tell you to go there, then you should not be afraid. And these are the legitimate fears of Jacob. And number three, Number three of God, uh, Jacob's fears, the promised bondage and affliction of the people. 
of his people in Egypt. We know, we know that in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be stranger in the land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. So you imagine, God tells you, if you go there, your children, your descendants will be oppressed and they will be enslaved. So you will be frightened because it's God himself telling you that your children will be oppressed. They will be enslaved 400 years. So Jacob naturally was fearful. And for us also, if we know that if we will go through that difficult aspect, you'll say, oh Lord, forget it. I don't want to go there. But if it's God's way of telling you, you proceed even if you will experience that so-called oppression and enslavement. If it is God telling you to go even to the valley of the shadow of death, He will say, I will not fear because thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. According to Psalm 23. So, the Lord said, Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. The Lord did not say, I will make you a great nation in the land of Canaan. He was saying, I will make you a great nation there in Egypt. But, making you a great nation, I have a promise that you will be a great nation together with that enslavement and oppression. You cannot or we cannot fathom the mind of God. How He will make a great nation in the, in the in the, in, in, the, uh, in the environment of oppression, in the environment of slavery. But that is how God works. So, do not be afraid. That's our third point here. Do not be afraid. God will fulfill His purpose. In these terms, the purposes of God on the nation of Israel is to make them into a great nation. And great nation starts with becoming plentiful, numerous, beyond counting and that is his purpose that's why i want to make you into a great nation there in egypt and then what god says god will do anong sinabi sa ng panginoon whether you are there whether the situation is difficult whatever he says god does not turn back to his words he will do it he will accomplish it psalm 23 verse 4 even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So when he makes you a promise, even if you go through life, even when life is difficult, the Lord will not say, okay, I will not let you pass through the valley of the shadow of death. I will make your life easy and comfortable, and then I will be with you. No, Psalm 23 states that all of us, no one is exempted, all of us will go through the valley of tears. Some part of our life, we will remember, if you will remember your past, that you have been through this valley of the shadow of death, where the, where the trials, the burdens, the tragedy is so burdensome, it's so difficult, it's so trying us. But you will know that even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. I'd like to take this opportunity opportunity to, to share to you my life. In the years 1990s before 2001, five years of that, God did something in my life. My father died in the span of five years. And then when, when we have a business, we met a car accident that somebody died. And then the third thing is uh, my second son died while still in the womb of his mother. And then finally, on the fifth year, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. So that is the valley of the shadow of death. But I can claim that God's word is true. So he will be also true to you. I can say that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And that was 12 years ago. And God has been so good and has been so merciful that me and my wife 
and my family is serving the Lord here at CCF. I praise God for that. And that is why all of us, I don't know what you're going through right now. You may be sick, you may be in a financial situation, maybe you have a frustrating situation between relationships, father and son, husband and wife, children, brothers and sisters, relatives. You may be in that valley of the shadow of death and you say, Lord, I'm so tired of this. I want to get out of this. Please help me. Then the Lord will say, my rod and my staff, they're enough to comfort you. And Romans 8.28, it says there, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. So when he says all, all the things, good, bad, medio bad, medio good, a little bit good, a little bit bad, but all encompassing, all of these things will work out for the good of his children. And if you love God, Paul says, all things work together for good to those who love God. Those who do not love God, all things will not work for good for them. But for those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who put their faith that Jesus Christ can only save them from their sins and will bring them back in reconciliation to the Father, and one day we will be having an eternal and forever fellowship with God in heaven, then all of these things, whatever we are experiencing here on earth, whether they be joyful, whether they be sorrowful, whether they'll be in the finish line or somewhere in between, all of these things will work together for our own good because God will do what He says. Whatever He says, He will really accomplish. Now, going back to our story, in Genesis chapter 46, verse 27, the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. So this is the total number of the family of Jacob from the land of Canaan, specifically from Hebron, then to Beersheba, then to Egypt. They were 70. And to prove to us, the Bible tells us that when they went out from Egypt and going back to the promised land, which is Canaan, they were more than 70. They are now a great nation. That is why in the book of Exodus, written by Moses, after the book of Genesis, it says there, And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Okay, remember, 70 entered Egypt. But in Exodus, 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So if you say one person married to a woman and then at least they have a child, then at least you have to say times three. So 600,000 times three, that's 2.4 million who went out of Egypt in the span of 200 years, more or less. But look at this. 2.4 million is only a conservative estimate. During those times, there was no family planning. There was no... Uh, birth control. So, it's more than 2.4 million. So, when they went out from Egypt to the land of Canaan, they were already a great nation. When the time of Moses came, when he led the people of Israel in the Exodus journey, crossing the Red Sea and going back to the Promised Land, they were already a great nation. So, the purposes of God has been accomplished in Egypt. What God says he will do. And then, in Genesis 46, verse 4, I will surely bring you up again, and Joseph will close your eyes. So what can we learn from here? I will surely bring you up again. Do not be afraid. God will fulfill His purposes. God accomplishes His purposes, His timing, not ours. So you will notice when the promise was given for 400 years, you will be enslaved. So when the, the enslavement happened, this is all according to God's plan. That's why he said, God accomplishes his purpose in his timing, not ours. 
So going back to my testimony, that five years when we were there in the fifth, in the third, the fourth year, we were, we were groveling. We were kneeling before God, Lord, when will this end? So when my wife was going to, through chemotherapy, that's a very difficult situation. My son was only a year old and my eldest daughter was five years old during that time. Now she's 19 and 30. So praise God for that. But during those times, you were praying, Lord, shorten the time, shorten the time so that I will wake up one day that life will be different from now. But the Lord says, do not be afraid. I will accomplish my purposes on your life just like what I did in the people of Israel. His timing. When the fifth year ended, praise God. God renewed my strength from sorrow, from mourning, to joyful dancing and gladness. And that is why we cannot find in our hearts not to serve God because of His wonderful things, the wonderful deeds that He has done in our lives. I really praise God for that. Aren't you glad that God is like that for us? Amen. Let's give a clap offering to God for that. In Psalm 30, verse 5, he said, For his anger is but a moment, but his favor for a lifetime. So if we have been going through this anger of God when the Lord disciplined us because he wants to lead us back in the right path, it's only for a moment, but his favor for a lifetime. In Psalm 30, moving on, Weeping may, be, may, may last for a night, but the shout of joy comes in the morning. So that's what we experience. Shout of joy comes in the morning. Okay, you have turned my morning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. So there is this morning and dancing. There's a saying that goes... All sunshine makes a desert. So if you have laughter, you have joy, you have gladness, when there is no rain, when there are no tears, you will be barren like a desert. And that is why God is so great that He will cause the rain to fall and the, 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 the sun to shine the plants so that the, the plants will grow so beautifully. Same with us children. We will experience sorrow, tears, but there are also times that we will experience sun, sunshine gladness, joy, because God is really a great God. Another one. Do not be afraid. God gratifies the innocent wishes of His people. God gratifies the innocent wishes of His people. In Genesis chapter 45, verse 28, then Israel said, it is enough my son Joseph is alive. I will go and see him before I die. So when, when Jacob was still in, in Hebron, he said, it is enough. So my wish is that I will go and see Joseph before I die. So that is his wish. And we know that it, it did happen. In chapter 46, verse 4, God promised Joseph, or God promised Jacob, Joseph will close your eyes. So before that, Joseph said, or Jacob said, I will go and see Joseph before I die. And God promised, I will go down with you to Egypt and I will surely bring you up again and Joseph will close your eyes. That means Joseph will outlive his father Jacob. He will be the one to close the eyes of Jacob. Because it's really very hurting and painful as fathers if we will see the death of our son. It's better that our son will see the death of us. And that is what Jacob was wishing. Okay, and Genesis chapter 46, Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. So after 22 years, after knowing that Joseph was dead, they had this opportunity to kiss, embrace, and cry. And that's part of the wishes of jo uh, Jacob. Jacob said to Joseph, I am ready to die now, what, now that I have seen you and know that you are still alive. So, you can die at the age of 130. And we know as we move further in our study that Jacob lived 17 more years than he died. 
So he had this 17 years together with Joseph. And then on the later portion of Genesis, Genesis 49, 33, when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last. So, so he died in the presence of his children. And then we know in the last chapter, then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Now, do you think the promise of God to Jacob that he will see his son and Jacob will close and Joseph will close his, his eyes was never accomplished. No, it was really accomplished because what God says he will do. So we can say here that God gratifies the innocent wishes of his people. So applying it to us, when we have these wishes before God, do not be afraid because God will really gratify those wishes for us, provided that we are making the godly decision. And then, do not be afraid. Go forward with confidence. Now, they were still in Beersheba at that time. So the Lord said, go down to Egypt. And so, you have to go forward with confidence. When the Lord tells you to do it, then move forward. In Genesis chapter 46, verse 5, then Jacob arose from Beersheba. So he did not just stay there because he was paralyzed because of, a, of his fear, knowing that one day they will be oppressed, they will be enslaved. No, he moved forward with confidence. He arose from Beersheba, okay, they took their livestock, and then they came to Egypt. Okay, Beersheba to Egypt. So they moved forward with confidence. So wherever we are, whatever situation we might be, we've, we've we felt or we thought that we are old and these things will not be for us anymore. Move forward because God will be with us. Okay? So all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. So we will now see the story unfolding that the people of Israel, the nation of Israel from the land of Canaan has now been moved in the land of Egypt. Now, what can we learn here? Follow God with your family. All persons belonging to J Jacob. So he says, all persons, all the 70 went in. And then also in verse 27, all persons in the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. So everyone, no one was left behind. Jacob did not say, okay, I'll just go there and my family, you'll just stay there. No. So what can we learn from here? So if we try to look at the story of Jacob, he first married Leah, and then they had seven children, six men, one girl. And then those numbers there are the children, like Reuben four and Judah five with two grandchildren. And when Jacob married Zilpha, the servant of Leah, they had Gad and Asher, and those numbers also. And then when Jacob married his, his crush of all time, his beloved, his one and only Rachel. So they had two children, Joseph and Benjamin. And Benjamin is the highest pointer of them all because Benjamin had 10 children. Okay, children, sorry. So, and then Jacob again married Bilhah, the servant of uh, Rachel, and then they had two children. These are the children of Jacob. And all in all, they are 70. So it was listed from chapter uh, from verse 8 to verse 27. So what can we learn here? Follow God with your family, husband, wife, and children be together. When we follow God, we do not say, oh, uh, you children, you're already old for that. You can make your own decision and me and your mom will just decide for this. No, we have to be together, especially when the children are very young. When we can hold their tongue, when we can influence so much their minds, we have to take them with us. Even when we decide to go to work somewhere other than if you are assigned in the military or if you are working in an oil rig offshore, you cannot bring your family there. Like, for, for example, you will go to Mama Sapano. You cannot do that. So you have to bring your family when as much as possible so that you will be following God with you. So in following God, consider your spiritual family. 
Why is this? In Genesis chapter 46, verse 10, when Moses was enumerating the names of the children of Jacob, he was saying, Simeon and his sons, Simeon is, is one of the children of Leah, Simeon and his son, Jimuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jacob, Zohar, and Shoal, the son of the Canaanite woman. So there must be something why Moses mentioned Shoal as the son of the Canaanite woman. Because Israel is a distinct nation separate from the people of Canaan. And that is why when Simeon heart, uh, heart, uh, broke the heart of his parents, when he married a Canaanite woman, Shoal was born. And then Moses was saying, this should be separate. We have to be a distinct nation. So when we consider spiritual family, we have to follow God. And when we bring our family, we have to look at it in a situation that we have a people like a church or a group of believers that we will be accountable to and will protect ourselves from our uh, walk, from, from the, the influence of the culture around us. So in following God, consider your spiritual family. Be set apart from godly influences. So when we make decisions, when we go to a place, we have to consider that there are people who will be influencing us. So we have to take care of our spiritual health. As 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, especially in deciding for marriage. So when you say, do not be bound together with unbeliever, of course, that's very, very clear. It is a sin for single people to get married with unbelievers. You will say, oh, I love him very much. I will just bring him and when he's already a believer, uh, when he's still an unbeliever, but I will just bring him to CCF or whatever fellowship that we have. No. God tells us, if he says, do not commit adultery, it's just the same as do not be bound together with an unbeliever. In Genesis 46, 33, when Pharaoh calls you and say, and say, what is your occupation? So he was instructing his brothers, when Pharaoh calls you and asks you, what is your occupation? This is what you will say. Your servants have been keepers of the livestock from our youth and even until now, both we and our fathers. In order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is abominable to the Egyptians. So you'll see there the highlight, in order that you, my brothers, my family, will dwell in the land of Goshen, for every Egyptians, uh, for every shepherd is abominable to the Egyptians. So what he was saying is, you will be placed in an area named Goshen that is far from the influence of Egypt. Okay, so he was placed there. So when Pharaoh asks you, you are shepherds. Because according to Egyptian culture, the shepherds are detestable. They are loathsome. They are abominable. And they don't want to converse or even to eat with them because they are shepherds. For whatever reason, we do not know. We can dig back to history and culture and the background. But this tells us that even if Joseph is very close to the heart of Pharaoh, Pharaoh will still want to be separated with them. And Joseph took that opportunity so that his family will not be influenced by the culture of Egypt. Yet at the same time, because Goshen is in the Nile Delta, because it's a fertile ground where the river meets the ocean, so we can be sure that this place will be the best of the land and they will be able to prosper there. So that's the Goshen area. And I think I have some pictures here where is that? So, so that's Beersheba. And then towards Goshen. Okay, that's the area of Goshen. And then Joseph's journey and Jacob's journey, the, the green one. So they will meet there. And the place named On is what we call the present day capital of Egypt, which is Cairo. Very, very near to that place. Or they call it Heliopolis. So this place where there is the seat of power where Joseph was doing his transaction as the prime minister of Egypt, he wants his family to be in Goshen so that his family will not be influenced. So Joseph has in mind, have in mind that his family must be separated. Yet at the same time, because of Pharaoh's generosity and respect for Joseph, 
He will place them far away from them, yet they are well blessed. They are well blessed in that fertile land. So Genesis 47.4, so the brothers of Jacob were saying, Now therefore, please let your ser servants live in the land of Goshen. And we know, because Pharaoh is also used by God, Pharaoh said, Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. So the Pharaoh is a little bit more political. He was saying, Get away from me, but rest assured, you have a better place. But that is according to the plan of God still. So Joseph achieved his plan to separate his family from the influence of the nation of Egypt. So for our family also, we have to look at the situation that we will look at the spiritual condition of our family. In following God, consider your spiritual family be set apart from ungodly influences. Bad company corrupts good morals according to 1 Corinthians 15.33. And in Romans 12.2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how can renewing of mind happens when you are surrounded by very, very strong influence who does not believe the Lord, who doesn't want to submit to His ways, to His word. So renewing of the mind when we consider our spiritual family is when we have fellowship, when we attend small groups, when we join the D groups, when we talk about what the wonders of God has been doing upon our lives, then we will be renewing our mind. We will be transformed. We will grow from glory to glory and be, became, become more Christ-like so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So when we walk in the path of the decisions we make, we can rest assured that it is good, it is acceptable, it is perfect. You will never be mistaken when you walk with God. So as a review, as we wrap up all of these things, how to make godly decisions. A thankful heart prepares us to listen to God's instruction. Number two, God reveals himself unmistakably. Do not be afraid. God will fulfill his purpose. This part is really very, very important. Do not be afraid. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So we guard our hearts and our minds when we have the peace of God. And then number four, follow God with your family. And finally, in following God, consider your spiritual family. Are we blessed today? Amen. 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 So let's give another clap offering to the Lord who is the, the author of all goodness, the author of all life. Let us all please rise as we close this uh, fellowship gracious and loving father we thank you once again for indeed you are the god who is forever the same yesterday today and forever and you have said in your word never will i leave you never will i forsake you lord whom we have in heaven but you and we desire nothing on earth except you walk with us O god allow us to contemplate in your words and instruct us more and more as we study your word. As we hunger and thirst for your word, we pray, dear God, that Sunday after Sunday, as we are instructed by your word, may we feast on them, may it transform us, and may we become more and more like your son Jesus to the glory of your name. And now as we part ways, O oh God, we pray, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. And everybody say, Amen. Amen.